I've also known a lot of the folks who work for other newspapers writing obituaries, uh, uh, so I'm happy to tell you how they do it, perhaps a little differently from ours as, as well. I want to mention that the Wall Street Journal actually added obits only a few years ago, uh, after long having resisted. And the belief was that the editors at the journal feared that by having obits, it may remind some of their core readers that they were not immortal. <laughs> <laughs> I fell in love with obituaries when I was 22, and I blame Harold C. Fox, who had died. It, um, the obituary ran in the New York Times, and it went like this. Harold C. Fox, the Chicago clothier, and sometime big band trumpeter who claimed credit for creating and naming the zoot suit with the reap pleat, the reeve sleeve, the ripe stripe, the stuff cuff, and the drape shape that was the stage rage during the boogie woogie rhyme time of the 1940s, died at his home in Florida. <laughs> From the wide padded shoulders and broad lapels of the long billowing jacket, to the ballooning high-waisted pants with the tourniquet tight peg cuffs and the inevitable long looping watch chain, the zoot suit was an exaggerated fashion fad that's, that not so much defined as defied an era of wartime conformity. It blew me away and got me thinking about how fun news stories could be, in particular, obituaries. Within a few years, I joined the Post and soon applied, uh, and, and soon there was a vacancy on the obituaries desk. A fellow there had died. And uh, it seemed, and I applied for the job, and it seemed nobody, no editor could believe why I would want the job. But I happen to think obitu the obituaries desk is the gem of the newsroom, where we get to write about everything, entertainment, military, history, politics, science, and economics, and the occasional wild eccentric. Where so much of what's in a newspaper, to me, seems a little like ephemera, I think obituaries really read like great short stories, weeks, uh, months, even years after, the, they're, after they've uh, appeared in print. On obituaries, we're all journalists. We have, to, we have to know a little bit about everything, and we have to be very careful, because we, more than any other part of the paper, write more about more than anyone else. And we often have to do it on deadline. I want to give you a quick summary of the history of obituaries. News obituaries, <coughs> I define as an appraisal of a life. And they appeared as long ago as 1620 in a British publication called The True Relation. And by the mid-19th century, the obituary form became well-established and had quite a bit of clout uh, with some degree of prestige attached to it. Establishment newspapers contained lyrical, often ornate obituaries about major figures of the day like Queen of Victoria in England and uh, the American poet Walt Whitman. By the 1920s, however, the sort of more of the staccato pro style at most newspapers effectively buried that, that more eloquent obituary form. And as a result, obituaries attracted a, a reputation, unfortunately, as a ground for freshman journalists or you know, the, the newsroom drunks. <laughs> the whole image of the paper really changed to, for that, to that quick ephemeral fix, and that languid obit style that had been so prevalent many years earlier really didn't suit that. So the, the prestige of, of the obit really uh, went to pot, with the exception of New York Times obituaries in the mid-20th century, uh, and the master, the undisputed master of the form, was a fellow named Alden Whitman, who visited major world leaders and often prepared advanced obituaries on them. He wrote a book called Come to Judgment, and he explained his criterion for a first-rate obituary, and this is his line. He said, an obituary should be a lively expression of personality and character, as well as a conscientious exposition of the main facts of a person's life. A good obit has all the characteristics of a well-focused snapshot. The fuller the length, the better. If the snapshot is clear, the viewer gets a quick fix on the subject, his attainments, his shortcomings, and his times. This view sort of defined an obit, all an obit could and should be, uh, until the obit revival of the 1980s. And that's when a bunch of mischievous-minded London obituary editors among them a guy named James Ferguson at The Independent and Hugh Massenburg of The Daily Telegraph ditched the emphasis on burying titans of industry and members of the House of Lords, unless they were fops or criminals, and included more pop culture figures such as rock stars and Hollywood starlets. They also urged a witty anecdotal approach that did not shy from noting a subject's unpleasant eccentricities. 
consider the London Guardian's 2001 account of a man named Simon Raven, which the newspaper called, in its headline, a promiscuous chronicler of upper class life. The obituary went like this. The death of Simon Raven at the age of 73 is proof that the devil looks after his own. He ought by rights to have died of shame at 30 or drink at 50. <clears throat> Instead, he survived to produce 25 novels, including Alms for Oblivion, a 10-volume saga of English upper-class life, numerous screenplays, eight volumes of essays and memoirs, including Shadows on the Grass, which a reviewer called the filthiest book on cricket ever written. <laughs> Such flamboyant, often startling stories have developed a fan base among many writers and editors in the United States. But as flavorful as those British obituaries can be, the general feeling is that the Brits are often happy to sacrifice accuracy for a great story. And that is to say a story might be too good to check out. Consider the obituary that the London Daily Telegraph wrote for uh, Sister Lucia de, Sa de Jesus dos Santos, who died in 2005 and she was 97. She was the last of three children said to have seen apparitions of the Virgin Mary outside the Portuguese town of Fatima in 1917. Now, I'm a pretty good researcher. If there's a great anecdote, I know, ex I, know I scour <coughs> high and low, I can come up with just great information. But the Telegraph had one line, had one a little bit of a, a wording in one of it in its obituary for this for this woman that I couldn't find anywhere, and it said, um, "The regional administrator kidnapped the children, and in a series of separate interviews, threatened to boil them alive in oil <laughs> if they did not deny the apparitions. When this failed, he cast them for a night into the county jail, where Lucia's cousin Francisco led the prisoners in prayer, and her other cousin Jacinta danced the fandango with a thief." <laughs> now, all the rest of it I could find proof for, but the dance, the fandango with a thief, is just sort of a, a coup de grace of the whole story. It, it makes the whole thing sing. And I asked years after the fact, when I met the editor of that story, where did you find that? It really been gnawing at me. He goes, well, you can't disprove it. <laughs> <laughs> By contrast, in the United States, obituaries can often read a little bit more formal. But the general view is that what we write is a matter of public record, trying to balance fun details with accuracy above all. On that note, let me end with my favorite correction. It's from the Daily Telegraph in 2001 and written by the paper's then obituaries editor, Andrew Mackay, and the headline is, The Day I Managed to Kill Off Tex Ritter's Wife. Dorothy Ritter is the woman. She's the wife of a cowboy star, Tex Ritter, <laughs> and the mother of an actor, John Ritter, that many of you may, remember, may recall, and she was prematurely buried by the newspaper. Mackay writes that the error occurred, quote, because a, a member of staff at her nursing home believed her to have died after arriving in a room to be told that she had gone, as she had, but to another wing of the hospital. <laughs> and that person then phoned the, other, uh, uh, phoned the newspaper, uh, and um, the story ran. So Mackay ends his apology this way. Mrs. Ritter may even have the good luck to follow Kaki Hoogterp, whose premature obituary in the Daily Telegraph published, was published in 1938. After 50 years, during which she sent back all her bills with the words deceased scrawled across them, <laughs> that story was referred to again in the newspaper. She wrote in to say, Mrs. Hoogterp wishes it to be known that she has not yet been screwed into her coffin. <laughs> <laughs>